the greater view oftentimes that dictates a lot of secondary views is the millennium. And so there are several views of the millennium out there. Premillennialism, that Christ is going to return before the thousand-year millennial reign. Postmillennialism would essentially teach that the world is slowly becoming Christian and will bring in the millennium, if I understand it correctly. And then all millennialism is basically just we're in the millennium now. We've been in the millennium since uh, I guess this is varying opinions there, day of Pente Pentecost, perhaps. And it's more spiritual. And so not a literal physical millennium. And so which view would you argue out of those views is most biblical and why? Yeah, I believe the premillennial view is the most biblical. I think amillennialism, there is a lot of true things that is said in the name of amillennial, amillennialism. Uh, we, I do believe Christ set up his kingdom in the first century, but I do believe it's a, it's a spiritual kingdom. And I believe um, what we are doing, I think what they're trying to explain in how they describe amillennialism, there's a lot of truth to it, but there's a few things they're missing. I think the main thing that they, uh, where they're missing the boat is in the fact that they don't understand uh, why the kingdom did not come in the first century. I think uh, there's things dispensationalists say, premillennial dispensationalists say about that that are true, but they just, they make the, they jump to the false conclusion that it was presented to Israel in the first century. They weren't ready. They've been put on hold for 2000 years and God's going to present it to them again, you know, at, at, at a second coming. That's bogus. No, it was presented to them in the first century. They weren't ready. But why is that? It wasn't just because of the fact they didn't accept Jesus. There were many things that they had not accomplished that they were supposed to accomplish. There were supposed to be people from every nation there that weren't there. Uh, it, one of the best studies you can ever do is go study the triumphal entry, go back and refer to every Old Testament scripture that is quoted from or that Jesus refers to in there, and it will teach you what he was looking for on that day of visitation. And when you realize what he was looking for, you will understand why the kingdom did not come in the first century, but then you will also understand what we are doing today. What we have been doing for the last 2,000 years is what Israel was supposed to be doing for you know uh, all the time that, uh, of their covenant, but they failed to do it because they were trying to do these things through the things of the temple, through the works of the law. We are doing these things under the new co and better covenant, and because of that, you know um, it is going to be successful the next time. And I do believe that Christ is going to return. And he is going to set up his kingdom. So a lot of things Amillennials will say about where we are now, uh, there's a spiritual truth to that. But when they deny a literal kingdom that's to come, I think they're an error uh, when they do that. I think they're jumping to a false conclusion. And so the premillennial view, uh, to me, uh, that is the most biblical too because of the fact that... Um, I guess because of the way I would, would interpret the book of Revelation. And it does appear to me that uh, I don't see any evidence in the scripture that the world's going to be getting better and that we're ever going to conquer the world for Christ. I, I don't see that. They've got a few scriptures that they use um, that causes them to think that. But I think there's multiple ways those uh, scriptures can be interpreted. I think there's a lot more clear scripture to show that things are going to get really bad that we are going to go through a time of trouble a time of persecution and i believe what's going to be happening during that time is it's going to be a time of purification for the church where um you know we've got a lot of fake churches we got a lot of fake christians and i believe before christ returns he's going to uh he's going to allow some things to take place to reveal who the true believers are and there and um i think that's a good thing you know, we want to be found faithful when Christ returns. And so um, to when you look at, to me, the book of Revelation describes premillennialism in the way premillennialists teach it. And then two, I mean, it definitely seems like we are heading in that direction. I don't think you can make a good argument that we're getting better in the world and that Christianity is filling the world. I think fake Christianity is 
filling the world in a lot of ways. But I mean, um, uh, one of the things that I've, I, I intend to do in the future is uh, often we have just kind of a false image in our mind of how things are going to play out when it comes to a lot of prophetic things. And a very interesting thing that you can do is if you use uh, past fulfillment of things as precedent, um, sometimes in prophecy, things are spoken of in very dramatic ways that causes us to almost exaggerate what those things will look like. And I think we've done that with a lot of things involving prophecy, especially when it comes to the wickedness. And I think I can show precedent that we are, in fact, in this world today, it is way more wicked than it has been in the past. And, and uh, I, I think I can display that. So, um, yeah, to me, premillennialism is the clearest or the most, uh, definitely has the most evidence. I would agree. It is, and I'm not sure if you'd agree with this, but it's basically the most straightforward reading of and literal reading of Revelation 20. Yes. Because, yeah. And I hear people say there's not one scripture that shows a literal thousand year kingdom. And it's like, well, actually, there is only one that shows a literal thousand year kingdom. And it's pretty clear. And it's Revelation 20. Now, mm -hmm. I will admit there's a lot of things in the Old Testament that people will use to point to the millennium that I would point to the millennium, but it never uses that term thousand years. You never see that anywhere in the scriptures, but there is one place where we see it in the scriptures. It's in Revelation 20. So you can't say we haven't got a single scripture. No, we do have a single scripture and it's and it is Revelation 20. Right. And, you know, I the explanations around that to me just are wanting well there seems to be a clear chronology in i would argue a two-part chronology in the book of revelation once we get to revelation 19 we are through the tr uh, trumpet and vile judgment hail and fire cast upon the earth all these uh supernatural judgments and then you get to revelation 19 which describes the final event comprising jesus's second coming at least the part where he comes on a white horse for the battle in armageddon and then immediately following that is revelation 20 where the antichrist is defeated false prophet is de uh, defeated those that uh, an aspect of the first resurrection those that get to rule and reign are those that did not take the mark of the beast they were beheaded for the the cause of christ and then as a result so we have cause and effect here a, a result of that victory is what Satan being bound in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. And so the all millennialist, correct me if I'm wrong, Pastor Tommy, they would have to take all of that, all of those significant events and place that into first century AD. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the full preterists make it 40 years, which right. I think is super weird. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think the all millennial position is as weird. Um, and, and, you know, right, and here's I the thing. There are some pretty consistent arguments for the most part uh, with amillennialism, but what they need to be open about and just admit, and that's what I try to do. I try to be very honest about where our arguments are weak and where mm -hmm. uh, and where they're strong, but everything is allegorical. Everything is symbolic, and there are allegorical and there are symbolic things in the scriptures, but you've got to prove, you got to do a better job proving your hermeneutic you're using. And uh, frankly, it to me, it just it's not there. The hermeneutics they're using are not convincing, you know, and they when they give you kind of their system on how they came to that conclusion, it just it doesn't work. Yeah. Those who didn't take the mark and they ruled and lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Right. I mean, that seems pretty clear. Some people didn't take the mark. It <clears throat> seems pretty clear they died a physical death, mm -hmm. that they were resurrected physically. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. I mean, the plain English of that fits what premillennialists teach. But what the other crowds are saying, they just don't, they don't work. It's like, that's, that's awful specific there. So right. the burden of proof is on them to prove that when you have such a literal statement, they've got a, the burden of proof is on them to prove it's not literal. And then too, when you have, 
you know, your post millennialists and your amillennialists too, who unlike the po the full preterists do affirm a coming future resurrection. Okay, if you believe in a literal resurrection, then why isn't this part literal where these people who didn't take the mark, they live and reign with Christ a thousand years? I So it's just, again, I think premillennialism, again, I think it is the best and it has the most evidence, but I think um, there are areas where there's a lot of assumption uh, that people preach in the name of premillennialism. I mm -hmm. think there's a lot of things that our crowd across the board in the premillennial world are very dogmatic about those things. It's like, well, that's actually not that clear. So uh, I can see where people from the other side are hearing a lot of dumb things said in the name of premillennialism or even things that's just speculation. And yeah. so to me, um, one thing I try very hard to do is be clear when I'm speculating and uh, and then, but then also show when I, Hey, we have clear scripture for this. And so, um, <clears throat> yeah, the premillennial crowd, we've, uh, we've allowed big names to speculate. And because there's been agreement uh, amongst the mainstream, we've just come to accept that as sound doctrine, but it's like, well, it's still speculation. There could be other interpretations of that. Doesn't mean premillennialism is false, but we don't do ourselves any favor when we're saying false things in the name of a true doctrine. Right. We need to be a consistent premillennial proponent. And as a consistent premillennial proponent, then I think we can most adequately or sufficiently address the preterist. Mm -hmm. And what you said here, I find interesting because if we're going to throw this into first century AD. And so just remove Revelation 20 out of its context. And your, your, your chapter breaks are not inspired. I think mm. we would all agree. You know, they were added after the fact, ease of navigation. And so there is a chronology going here. We have Revelation 19 and then events immediately following Revelation 19 here with the thousand year millennial reign and the binding of Satan. But you mentioned these believers they're beheaded mm -hmm. so if, if they're beheaded you're dead if you lose your head i'm assuming you're, you're not alive physically anymore right right and so when it says those that did not take the mark upon their foreheads i've asked people both full preterists and all millennial proponents okay where in first century ad was there a mark instituted worldwide that if you didn't take on your right hand or your forehead you can't buy or sell and typically they'll have to over allegorize or over spiritualize it because there's not really anything as far as I know in my study that they can point to as clear historical evidence. So anyways, these people are beheaded, but then they lived. So this living has to be glorification or final sanctification, the resurrection of our bodies mm -hmm. and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And so if this thousand years is now and it's longer than a thousand years, it's more spiritual than physical then where are people living in glorified bodies? Does the, if all millennialism is true, does that argument make sense to you, pastor? Yeah. Well, yes, because, and here's the other thing too. Um, you know, you'll listen to these full preterists kind of scoff at a lot of the things that we'll say, you know, and they'll talk about dead corpses coming out of the grave. And right. I, that's exactly what I believe. But, um, you know, the, the one verse that I like to bring up is in Hebrews. 1135 when it says uh, women received their dead raised to life again and others were tortured not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection we're, we're seeing in this passage people who died physically for their faith and they did it lo looking for a better resurrection we see men like abraham who was uh was given a promise of a country, but he never received that promise. He had, he'd seen it afar off. And it, it, it definitely would appear in the Bible that these, all these people who died, you know, in their, uh, you know, in, in faith that they are going to have a payback one of these days, they are going to receive these things. We are going to sit down with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom. The, the apostle Paul in first Corinthians 15 you know, he's saying if there is no resurrection of the dead, 
then, you know, what about those who are baptized for the dead? You know, and why stand we in jeopardy every hour? What, what is he saying there? What about all these people who are dying for their faith and that are, are going through all these terrible things? It's a waste if there is no resurrection. But there is a resurrection. And so because of that, it's not a waste. You know, the best we're going to get, maybe 100 years on this earth, but we've got another thousand years where we're going to rule and reign on this earth with Christ. And we've got the new heaven and new earth that's still to come. And if this is the new heaven and new earth, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. New heaven and new earth stinks. Right. The, would, yeah. Are you going to try to tell me the new heaven and new earth is going to have a pride month in an entire country of 300 million people? No. That's not happening on the new heaven and new earth. Great point. So my next question, then we'll move into, into the rapture. Uh, I have a couple questions there, and then we'll start opening it up for people to join. I do see at least one person backstage. Anybody who wants to join for some, even just Q&A, maybe you agree with us, you agree with Pastor Tommy, but you have a question, clarifying question. Now's your opportunity. We're doing this live. It is an open mic. I've got the StreamYard link pinned. And so feel free to join. So my question would be, Pastor Tommy, what would be? Well, first thing I want to say is I feel like the millennium debate is oftentimes framed incorrectly. You know, it, it's typically about the thousand years. Is the thousand years literal? Is it physical? Well, something associated with the thousand years is the binding of Satan. That Satan is bound in the bottomless pit. For a thousand years, he's sealed, he's chained, and it's that he can't deceive the nations anymore. So I like to ask, rather than is is the millennium a literal thousand years? Is it symbolic? Is Satan? Are we in the millennium now spiritually? The question is: Is Satan bound mm -hmm. now? And so my question would be, and I'll give what I think is a good argument first, and then get your thoughts. What? Do you believe is a good scriptural line of evidence for Satan clearly not being bound? And one scripture that jumps out at me, and there's many, of course, mm -hmm. but one in Revelation 2, because this is first century AD. If I understand the all millennial position correctly, they would admit at this point with the seven churches, we would be in the millennium. Satan would be bound. But Revelation 2:10 <clears throat> has the devil, who, if all millennialism is is if it's correct. Mm -hmm. then the devil would be bound at this point, but he's casting believers into prison and that they're going to experience tribulation. They're going to be tried. Well, it doesn't really sound like Satan is bound in prison, locked up in any means if he is locking people up, leave, uh, locking believers up. And so I, I think there would, would be a good scriptural line of evidence that Satan is clearly not bound and he is... Mm -hmm free pastor tommy any thoughts on that yeah well he, it also mentions too i forgot which uh city it was that it says where satan's seat is i mean what All is right. he doing with the seat what's he doing with the place of authority if he's bound up um you know why is it in peter it talks about your adversary the devil walketh about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour you know the big question that we can talk about is you know what does the binding of satan mean exactly because you know the amillennialist they will make some you know valid points about well you know it doesn't mean he's necessarily completely out of commission but he's kind of on a leash you could say um you know for example too in job uh he wanted to get it job but god had put a hedge about him we also see in the scriptures we always see michael withstanding satan uh and and fighting with satan and in, in revelation we specifically see, um, you know, Michael uh, basically casting him out of heaven. Um, I personally think that Michael is the restrainer that we see in Second Thessalonians chapter two. That uh, right now, I think right now you can make a good argument that there is a restraint that's on Satan. And one of these days, uh, you know, God's going to tell Michael, "All right, give him the green light," and then Satan is going to have his way on this earth. So. Yeah, there's all different levels of power that God gives Satan. So, but the thing is, when he's bound in the pit, which is what we see in the scriptures, uh, that does seem like Satan is being uh, put uh, put away in a way he hasn't before. Specifically, too, he's put away in the bottomless pit, so we will not deceive the nations. 
anymore. Well, in Revelation, he's got a city where his seat is. Um, it sure does look like the nations are being deceived right now. You know, in Revelation 2, we have a synagogue of Satan. Um, you know, so, you know, there's, you know, I don't know. To me, you can't make a good argument that Satan is bound like we see in Revelation 20. You can make an argument that he's that he's he's on a leash to a certain extent, but uh, he he's not bound. He's not in the pit. He's walking about his roaring line, seeking whom he may devour. You know what does that mean? We can't just devour anybody because he he is limited, um, and and that's why we want to stay close to God. So you know we're not we don't give Satan an opening. So I don't know if that helps at all. Yes, it does. It isn't what you said in many ways true all throughout history. Satan mm -hmm. has not had absolute power. He, right. God will it, allow him a certain degree of power, but not unlimited power. Right. And I would I would go as far as saying too that um Satan uh, lost a great deal of power uh at the resurrection of Christ. I mean, right. I think he got his head bruised uh mm -hmm. during that time. And so um yeah, I mean, look at the stranglehold Satan had over the nations for 4000 years but yet yeah, look at what ha look at what we see happen after the resurrection obviously a vast majority of that you know and it's all connected it's because of what Jesus accomplished and also we see the comforter coming and the the empowering of the believers uh with the holy spirit um that has made a huge difference but all of that is something that has greatly limited satan in a way so i think a lot of your amillennialist they are they're at you know they're showing a lot of good things to show what happened to satan um and the power that he lost you know at the in in the first century but i don't think you can make a strong argument that he is like in a pit especially when we see him walking about his roaring line and peter and i here's one of my big questions for preterists okay? one of my big questions for preterists is what changed in 70 AD for Christians, because it mm -hmm. seems like Christians for the last 2000 years, we've at least been attempting to operate exactly the way we were told to operate by the guys like the apostle Paul. It, it's the same thing. Nothing, nothing changed when Jerusalem was destroyed. What changed in the church in Ephesus and Thessalonica and all these churches we see in the scriptures, nothing changed. Right. I mean, when you read all of the Paul's epistles and when we read first and second Peter and James, Jude, when we read all of these things, it's like it is not hard to just make perfect application for our churches today because of the fact we are in the same situation that they were. We're in the same period. N nothing changed after 70 A.D. Well, there's a lot of good points there, and we could almost do a three-hour show just on the millennium, but a couple of things you said there, and I think where the all-millennialist gets things right has to do with the fact that, yes, uh, you can say Jesus Christ conquered spiritually in first century AD. He came while the Roman Empire was ruling the known world. He's ruling and reigning in the hearts of believers today. He has all power and authority in heaven and earth. Is he exercising all that power? That would be the next question. But in, and maybe we can speak to this, we can get into dual prophecy fulfillment, shadows versus more literal fulfillments. I think this is a, a, an important understanding in end time theology. But when it comes to salvation, I've heard you speak on this. When we trust Christ, when we get saved, we're saved, passed from death into life spiritually, we're regenerated. But the salvation of our bodies is not until future, the redemption of our bodies. So that's the aspect of salvation that's future. So we are saved, but at the same time, we will be saved, but that's not until glorification. So.